Welcome to Radical Feminist Perspectives. Today we're going to hear about Harriet Taylor's writing and it's part two. Uh, we've, we've had a, a webinar about Harriet Taylor's writing a few weeks ago. So if you haven't seen it, go back and look on YouTube for the first one. It's gonna be discussed by Kate Newey. And uh, this is a women only webinar as part of our uh, Radical Feminist Perspective series. Um, it's run by radical feminists who, whose voices have been cancelled or silenced in universities, schools and the media. Frustrated, we can't share what we know in these places. We're offering this online series of webinars here. Enjoy. So thank you so much, Kate, and over to you. Thank you, Joe. It's a real pleasure to come back to talk about Harriet Taylor again. And I thought I'd also um, include uh, something about the work of her daughter, Helen Taylor, to show how we go from the beginning of the 19th century to, all, to, to the beginning of the 20th century with this sort of family of feminist activists. Um, just checking everyone can see my screen. Is that all right? Can, can we see that, Joe? Yes, that's perfect. Lovely. Great, I'll get going. So just a, a tiny recap um, from um, last time I spoke to everyone. This is Harriet Taylor Mill, although she was never really known in her own lifetime as Harriet Taylor Mill. She was born Harriet Hardy. Um, she married uh, John Taylor um at 18 uh and they uh were a family and this is quite important they were attendants at the very radical unitarian church in finsbury north london um run by william johnson fox um and that whole fox family um were quite radical social reformers. And when you start looking at social reform in the 19th century, this Unitarian background um, pops up again and again and again. Um, it's a, a very Protestant version of Christianity, which um, broadly spoken, and if anyone is a, an actual Unitarian, I'd love to know more about the, the practice today, um, who didn't believe in the Trinity. Um, uh, they believed that Jesus Christ was not uh, the, the spirit, the, the son of God, but just a very, very um, good man who, whose example we should all follow. Anyway, uh, but it gave them a, um, a, an interest in social reform. Um, Harriet Taylor met John Stuart Mill in um, the early 1830s, and they carried on a very long, very celibate relationship, but a very passionate relationship until John Taylor died um, and Harriet insisted on two years of um, separation between herself and John Stuart Mill and then they married and very sadly they married in the 1850s very sadly Harriet Taylor Mill as she was then died in 1858 in Avignon which is going to be relevant for later in my talk. Um, so John Stuart Mill is um, often seen as one of the most eminent kind of philosophers, but uh, philosophers of um, the, the, rela the, the relationships between the sexes in the 19th century. And last talk, I um, outlined the role that Harriet Taylor had in the work that she and John Stuart Mill produced together. Today, I'm going to look at some of the work that they did much more separately, but I thought I'd just put up the final paragraph of The Subjection of Women, which is the very famous essay in 1868 that they published together. And really, it's the culmination of the 30 years of writing and thinking that they did together from the time they met to, um, to Harriet Taylor's uh, death in 1858. Um, and then Helen Taylor, Harriet Taylor's daughter, um, took over uh, and became John Stuart Mill's, she's often described in the kind of male philosophical world as John Stuart Mill's secretary. But what I hope to show today is that she did a lot more than that. Uh, this is the final paragraph of The Subjection of Women. And the thing I talked about last time was that um, I think The Subjection of Women is a very refreshing text in the kind of maelstrom of thinking and theory that we have nowadays. 
Uh, we talk a lot about the problematic nature of postmodern theory and queer theory and its impact on feminism. What Harriet Taylor and John Stuart Mill did was to argue very, very logically. And um, we'll see this logic throughout the, the work that I want to show today. Um, they talk about the rationality of excluding, disqualifying, as they say here, the positive evil caused to the disqualified half of the human race. And they talk about the, the feeling, but also the kind of losses that we have. Uh, first in the loss of the most inspiriting and elevating kind of personal enjoyment. And of course, Mill, John Stuart Mill was um, taught by his father, James Mill, who was uh, um, a close friend of Jeremy Bentham. Together, they developed this notion of utilitarianism, that the way forward for British society uh, and for the progress and progression of humankind was the greatest good for the greatest number of people. Um, and so Mill uses this uh, principle in, in much of his philosophy and here Harriet Taylor is picking this up in thinking about the development of, you know, how can we have social progress as a whole if one half of the human race um, is uh, oppressed and, um, you know, and they use these strong words like evil, I think very interestingly. So that's just a kind of a, a brief recap of what I looked at last time. But I wanted to go back to the moment just after the writing that Harriet Taylor did, just after she and Mill met and realized that they were kindred spirits. And Mill talks about this in his autobiography. He says, you know, two people that are so connected that they think as one. Um, historically, a lot of critics have talked about the way that Mill overstates this, that he was so madly, madly enamored of Harriet Taylor um, that he can't see uh, that really she was just a little domesticated woman. But, but actually what we've got here is this slide is Mar Harriet Taylor's statement on marriage. And when they, they met in 1831, by 1832-3, so a, a year to 18 months later, they exchange statements on marriage because divorce at that point in the 19th century was very, very, very difficult. Basically, you needed almost an act of parliament to divorce. Um, the woman in the divorce was uh, inevitably seen as um, completely outside the pale of respectable society. The children belonged to the man, to her husband. So if Harriet Taylor had divorced, she probably would never have seen her children again, or she was put in that position that her, her ex-husband, John Taylor, their father, could forbid her ever from seeing her children again. Um, so this is... Um, her, one of her statements about marriage. And you can see already one of the themes of the subjection of women is something she's already thinking about. This sentence, whether nature made a difference in the nature of men and women or not, it seems that now that all men, with the exception of a few lofty minded, are sensualists more or less, women on the contrary are quite exempt from this trait, however it may appear otherwise in the cases of some. It seems strange that it should be so, unless it was, was, was meant to be a source of power in demi-civilized states such as the present, and so on. Um, and she then goes on to say, women are educated for one single object to gain their, mar their living by marrying. And she mentions those women who are not married. So she's already thinking very radically here. Some poor souls get it without the church going in the same way that they, they do not seem to me a bit worse than their honored sisters. Very radical thinking in this period. So she's already wondering about this whole nature nurture question. And this is a question that is consistent throughout her thinking and um, her thinking with John Stuart Mill when they come to write The Subjection of Women Together. 
And it's something her daughter, Helen Taylor, keeps on thinking about. And it's the big question of the 19th century. Are women born this way? Or are they conditioned or socialized because of the, the, the law of force? You know, and Mill and Taylor spend a lot of time in the subjection of women talking about the way that earlier societies based on um, the kind of law of power or force, physical force, physical power. Um, so they're already thinking about sexual difference in the different kind of physical um, lives of men and women, that women have children, that men are more phys uh, physically stronger, um, and, and the imbalances that those differences lead to. They're already asking the question, are those differences necessary? If women and men were equal in terms of the way that society treats them, would women only be thinking about marriage? Um, and then she goes on rather cynically, I think, in the next um, paragraph, and this is towards the end of the, the letter. It's about three pages long in the printed version. And these, are, these exist in manuscript, but they've been beautifully um, reproduced by Anne and John Robson, um, who between them were the editors of, I forget, I think it's about 30 volumes of John Stuart Mill's collected works. And then they produced a separate volume of uh, Harriet Taylor and John Stuart Mill on um, sexual equality. Uh, so a lot of manuscript material I'm going to be talking about today. Um, the manuscripts are all in um, at the uh, London School of Economics um, uh, and some of them in the Folger Shakespeare Library in DC. So uh, if you're near either of those, you can go and read them um, in their original state. Um, uh, now you can see from the opening uh, or the, the first sentence I've, I've reproduced here, one observes very few marriages where there is any real sympathy or enjoyment of companionship between the parties. The woman knows what her power is and gains by it what she has taught, been taught to consider proper to her state. The woman who would gain power by such means is unfit for power. Still, they do use this power for paltry advantages, and I am astonished it has never occurred to them to gain some large purpose, but their minds are degenerated by habits of dependence. Um, and this is a, a really interesting, quite complex example of a woman thinking about, indeed, her own state or the perils of her own state of marriage and motherhood. You know, this is a woman who is married with three children, was married at the age of 18, thinking about the nature of marriage. I'm not sure that she um, is reflecting on a lack of sympathy or enjoyment in her own marriage to John Taylor. By all accounts, it was not an unhappy marriage. And certainly when he became ill with cancer, um, she and her daughter returned to the matrimonial home to nurse him. Uh, she was very careful of his reputation. She understood what she had done by uh, to his reputation, but she's reflecting on the fact that this is seen as her moral burden. And she's also reflecting on um, the way in which this dependence corrupts the woman, that, that her constraints within the, the patriarchal structures of marriage as they exist in the early 19th century, um, as it were, corrupts women's moral character. And that's really speaking in very 19th century terms. And what's really interesting about this, I think thinking backwards, is Mary Wollstonecraft, who's kind of the mother of us all in many ways, in her book um, on uh, a vindication of the rights of women, is also very critical of marriage and what it does to women. She basically argues that it can sort of turn women into airheads. And it, at first glance, this seems like blaming women for their own oppression. But I think it's a really interesting thinking through of, right, this is where I am. How have I been made this way? How can I think my way through this? Um, and what might be the, the motives for action? Um, and, and I think, um, you know, given the constraints and limitations of women's lives, uh, where marrying was the most e important economic decision 
that women could make, um, particularly if they were, uh, you know, educated, respectable, working or middle class women. Um, uh, once a woman married, anything she earned, any property became her husband's. Um, and so uh, for women who worked and women always worked, uh, picking a husband who was also a good worker and not a drunkard was really important so that her money, which became her husband's, could be the household money. And we'll see this later on in um, the writing of Harriet Taylor and John Stuart Mill on the laws around um, domestic violence and so on. Um, so uh, the final paragraph uh, of this uh, letter, and it's really a love letter to John Stuart Mill, although it's the most uh, philosophical and logical and uh, highfalutin love letter I've, I've ever read, but this is the final paragraph. Sex in its true and finest meaning seems to be the way in which is manifested all that is highest, best and beautiful in the nature of human beings. None but poets have approached to the perception of the beauty of the material world, still less of the spiritual, and there never yet existed a poet except by the inspiration of that feeling which is the perception of beauty in all forms and by all the means which are given us as well as by sight. Are we not born with the five senses merely as a foundation for others which we may make by them? And who extends and refines those material senses to the highest into infinity best fulfills the end of creation? That is only saying who enjoys most is most virtuous. It is for you, and this is she's directly addressing Mill here, the most worthy to be the apostle of all loftiest virtue, to teach such as may be taught that the higher the kind of enjoyment, the greater the degree. Perhaps there is but one class to whom this can be taught, the poetic nature, nature struggling with superstition. You are fitted to be the savior of such, and there it finishes. So it's kind of saying, you know, you're fit here to teach us how best we might live. Uh, but I think what's really interesting here is that a woman um, who's had three children knows the multiple meanings of that word sex. I mean, in the 19th century, had she wanted to talk about um, male, female, heterosexual um, sex, as in the sex act, she would have probably used the word intercourse. Maybe that would have been the most um, direct word. Uh, but I think that meaning is floating there in this paragraph. And the literary critic in me wants to see the multiple meanings in this paragraph. Uh, but what's really interesting is that she's using Mill's very earliest thoughts on utilitarianism, which no doubt he had discussed with her, and interpreting them in her way about um, personal relationships and relationships between people and seeing those love relationships within this broader context of how best we might make a good society. Um, and just to, to sort of uh, um, say thank you to Joe and Sheila and all the people that run these seminars, yesterday on Feminist Question Time, uh, there was a really interesting discussion about therapy and the, the move from friendship and care as personal relationships into a much more sort of um, monetized um, rela therapeutic relationships. And I think here what, and I was thinking about this uh, seminar I was preparing for today and thinking about the way that what Taylor and Mill are trying to do is find ways within broader social structures to have a place for intimate personal relationships as part of the intellectual and the political kind of struggle. Um, so I, I think that we can take a lot from this material. So now from these wonder, this wonderful exchange of, of kind of philosophical love letters, probably Wollstonecraft and Godwin's letters, uh, um, 30, 40 years earlier, maybe our, our other parallel in the, the work of, of um, 19th century of early feminists and the work of our feminist mothers. Now I want to um, uh, spend a bit of time looking at Taylor and Mill's um, publications on domestic violence. And it's a series of leading articles in a daily national newspaper, The Morning Chronicle. I've not really put them in chronological order, um, but what they do 
is they pick up on cases that have been reported in the news. And they're generally cases at the magistrate's court of male violence in the family. So just to let you know, there's a lot of discussion here about, um, just to sort of give you a warning, this is difficult material. There's a lot of discussion about physical power within marriage, um, female suicide, um, and men uh, beating and killing their children. Um, it's horrible. Um, but what Taylor and Mill point out, each, each article, they keep coming back to the stupidity and inadequacy of British law for dealing with these matters. Um, so this is their general uh, reflection on the law of assault, which is a reflection coming from a reflection on a couple of court cases. Um, and here they uh, talk about uh, what's evident that these men have the belief of their right to inflict almost any amount of corporal violence on their wife or their children. And what they point out is that the law enables men to consider wives and children as property. And they go on, um, and I'm not going to read a lot of this out. You can go back um, on, on the, um, I'm happy to send the slides to anyone who emails me, Google my name and you'll find me at my university. Um, but uh, I think these will also be available on the YouTube. Um, uh, but they, um, they, they really push the fact that the law and the magistrates uh, that, that the powers that the law and gives the magistrates are risible, you know. Um, so they say here, this is still on the essay, The Law of Assault. Um, the atrocious cases now summarily disposed of by magistrates with a 40 shilling fine or two months imprisonment should be tried with judicious solemnity in the courts which try other grave offences and should be visited with a just gradation of penalties rising to the highest secondary punishment. And now this is what they point out is this is in the context of um, a law which had this been a theft of property, um, the highest primary punishment would have been death or transportation. Um, then their final paragraph in the law of assault outlines that actually quite simple legal reform would be um, sufficient to, to change the situation. And this is a theme throughout all of this work. Uh, it's a theme that we might now look back on and go, oh, the naive fools. Um, is that if you change the law and you give magistrates power and you give protection of law to women and children, for example, you will change the behavior of men. Um, uh, I think in a sense, we've done the first part of that, but it hasn't necessarily led to the second part of that. And that's kind of conundrum we live in now. Um, but I would always argue that, um, Taylor and Mill and other reformers of the 19th century, people like Josephine Butler and Lydia Becker, people who um, uh, worked very hard to reform the law, that that was necessary work to do, um, to do and possibly, you know, alongside the work that the second wave feminists then started to do from the 1950s onward. Um, but what they say is all that would be requisite is a short act of parliament providing that judicial conviction of gross maltreatment should free the victim from the obligation of living with the oppressor and from all compulsory subjection to his power. So what they're saying is make divorce easier, make it obvious that a, a woman should not be forced to return to a man who's beaten her to within an inch of her life. Um, so, you know, I mean, when you go back to this material, you sort of start to realize how far we've come, but also then 
where we need to go. So the next article is on domestic violence, um, the case of Anne Bird. And what's really interesting about this is that it's a case where a woman has been up at, um, at the magistrate's court through the Malabone Police Office um, for cruel maltreatment of a child with a whip. Um, so here we are. The magistrate, um, let me find my place. The magistrate did what magistrates in such cases usually do. He talked of the ex extreme atrocity of the case as if strong words would do away with the effect of weak acts and then sentenced the woman to the greatest penalty he could summarily, summarily inflict a fine of five points or in default of payment, two months imprisonment. If this woman under the pressure of poverty had stolen five shillings, the magistrate would not have failed to commit her for trial. And if found guilty, she would probably have been transported. But her offence being brutal cruelty, practised on a creature utterly helpless and unoffending, he did not deem it worthwhile to try whether a higher court would be of opinion that a case of extraordinary atrocity deserved greater punishment than two months imprisonment. At the end of two months, the child, no doubt, will be given back to its torturer. Unless before that time, as happened in a similar case not long ago, it dies of the injuries received. And I think they spell that out really, really straightforwardly and directly, and it's difficult to read. I think they spell that out to show the extent, not just of the atrocity of the woman's action, but the atrocity of the law and the imbalance of the law. Um, the imbalance of the law that protects property, but not the helpless, not the weak, not people. Um, uh, and um, this is the, the aim of all of these articles on domestic violence is about the effect of bad law, um, the way that bad laws regulate and control uh, people. And I think what's also interesting in this um, para, in this, this this article, is that they actually do talk about the woman's poverty, um, and this is the concluding paragraph of that article, and they they actually focus um, very firmly on the poverty of the the woman charged. As a matter of either justice or humanity, these things speak so plain a language as ought to be in no need of commentary. But of course, rhetorically, they then go on to give us a commentary because no one is making these commentaries. What it is of more importance to insist upon then is their demoralizing effect. Attention has of late been much directed to the overcrowding of the laboring population as a source of moral evils. Let anyone consider the moral, the degrading moral effect in the midst of these crowded dwellings of scenes of physical violence repeated day after day, the debased, spirit broken, downtrodden condition of the unfortunate woman, the most consistent sufferer from domestic brutality in the poorer classes, unaffectedly believing herself to be out of the protection of the law. So what they're saying is, no wonder this woman behaved in such a way. She saw daily evidence that the law was not there to protect her. The law whose utmost exertions would not be more than enough to withstand this mass of depraving influences, makes so little use of its powers and opportunities, measures out its reproofs and punishments by such a scale that the culprits believe almost the worst of these brutalities to be venial and all minor ones to be actually permitted, while the victims regard their suffering and debasement to be the regular course of things which the law sanctions and the world allows. And when not crushed entirely, they seek a wretched compensation by tyrannizing in their turn when any hapless fellow creature comes within their power. I think this is kind of really, they really lay out the effect of male violence and the lack of a law which condemns male violence. So if a man sees his wife and children as property, a woman realizes, the mother realizes she's completely unprotected, driven 
to extremes by the violence inflicted on her, her whole mindset becomes that of, well, violence is the only way in this situation. Um, and I think when women, when feminists in the second wave started to work on the impact of domestic violence on children that becomes family violence, they talked about um, sort of the domestic violence that I know in Australia they talked about the battered wife syndrome that the woman herself comes to see violence as the only language of the the family the familial relationship and I think it's extraordinary that Taylor is seeing this you know 200 years ago or more than 200 years ago 250 years ago um, so the final difficult um and, and they wrote about 10 articles together on this, but I've just picked out three. This is one on the suicide of Sarah Brown. And I've given us a picture here, which comes from a, a graphic narrative made by George Cruikshank, who's a really interesting 19th century um, kind of graphic illustrator um, and illustrates some of the low life of London in the first half of the 19th century. He um, starts as one of those Regency sat satirical comics then um, as a drunkard himself, uh, goes clean, um, literally steps on, on the wagon of, of temperance and then makes these two series, The Bottle and The Drunkard's Children of eight illustrations each showing the sins of alcohol in the 1830s and 40s. Um, and this uh, picture of a young woman throwing herself off a bridge becomes a kind of trope of the middle and end of the 19th century. And I've got a few pictures coming up, but um, it's not an illustration. This is my illustration. So just to give us a sense of this um, story of a woman drowning herself um, over the loss of an illegitimate child, which is what the story of Sarah, uh, Sarah Brown is. Um, and it's a story that becomes a powerful story that is retold in Victorian, in 19th century novels, um, uh, Elizabeth Gaskell, uh, George Moore, many, uh, Tess of the D'Urbervilles, many, many writers pick up this story of the woman who is seduced by the so-called gentleman um, and ends in, in the, the poor young woman's death. Um, uh, so Mill and Taylor are making a commentary on um, a case, the suicide of Sarah Brown. Um, and, and it's an interesting case because the magistrate, and we can see here, the magistrate, um, the, the father tries to take the illegitimate child from its mother, from, from Sarah Brown. And the magistrate judges that... Um, the, um, the case comes before a magistrate and the magistrate judges that he, the magistrate, had no right to compel the woman to give up one half of her child. She had a legal and a moral right to the comfort, such comfort as it could afford her, and she had a right to any hold over the man who had deserted her. In the case of lawful marriage, the law has thought it fit to give to one only of the parents, the one being, brackets need it be said, the one who by himself or by his representatives makes the law, exclusive power over the children, and so on. And so they use this article, The Suicide of Sarah Brown, to argue the injustice of the law that gives the husband, the father, the only parent who has the rights over the children. But in this case, um, the, um, the, the mother has um, some rights. And um, what happened in this case was that um, uh, the magistrate gave custody one month to the father, one month to the mother, but the father came and just took the child and uh, Sarah Brown um, ended her life by suicide, by jumping off Waterloo Bridge. But again, Mill and Taylor come back to this question about one half of the human species not really having any confidence that um, the law will protect them. Um, they feel 
the most complete assurance to the utmost limits of common decency and often beyond, a tribunal of men will sympathize and take part with the man. And accordingly, they die in protracted torture from incessant rep repeated brutality without ever, except in the fewest and rarest instances, claiming the protection of law. This is the concluding paragraph. And it's I, I've quoted this because in many of these articles that they write, the final paragraph is a quite devastating restatement of their argument. If such as the justice society deals out to those women in the humbler classes whom it calls respectable, what must an unfortunate creature like Sarah Brown expect? And who can wonder that driven to desperation by the cruelest wrong, through a wrong, though a wrong wholly unsanctioned by law, she seeks relief, not from a magistrate, but from suicide, without having even a momentary thought that the law would do anything for her, or that the law was anything but one of the instruments by which society hunts down those who have violated its rules and incurred its displeasure. I just think that's absolutely devastating. And this is published in a national daily newspaper. Um, and I, I just, you know, these sort of paragraphs catch my breath at the um, articulacy of the way that they articulate the problem. It's tough reading and it's tough work. Um, and Mill, um, after Harriet Taylor's death, continued this work in a couple of ways. And I spoke last time about um, uh, John Stuart Mill's work as a member of parliament. The first private members bill that he presented was uh, to give suffrage to women on the same grounds as men. Um, and I now want to talk a little bit about um, uh, Helen Taylor and her activism together with her stepfather, but also her activism after his death. Um, and I, I introduced Helen Taylor briefly last time I um, spoke to everyone. So here's just a recap. Um, I'm gonna have to race through this because I'm realizing I'm, I'm getting, we're, we're rapidly going through the hour. Um, so Harry, Her, Helen Taylor was Harriet Taylor's youngest child. She became a suffrage campaigner. She um, edited with her father his works and published and edited many of his works after his death. She also trained as an actor under the tutorship of Hanny Sterling. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. There's a marvellous couple of articles that I draw on of other historians who have spoken about the importance of her work as an actress for um, uh, her future work as a feminist activist and campaigner. And she was active in local government um, and elected to the school board in Southwark. So hopefully I'll touch on all those points of her work. And it gives us just this wonderful sense um, of uh, work in feminist activism by this one family. There are many other families across the century. Um, and the thread that runs through it all is the logic and the rationality of women having full rights as human beings and full rights as citizens. Um, and they keep coming back to this sort of, the, the harms, the evils that are done by excluding half of the population and the way that this is utterly logical to give women exactly the same rights as men. So um, Helen Taylor, I want to talk a little bit about her acting career and most of my work and most of what I'm going to tell you here um, is drawn from the wonderful research of Janet Smith and Claire Stern and Janet Smith has published a couple of articles she wrote a PhD on Helen Taylor and she's published a couple of sort of academic articles from that um, uh, so uh, I have access to these through my work so I just thought I would give you some extracts from this um, Helen Taylor uh, was always keen on the theatre. As a child, she uh, saw as much theatre as she could um, and she read plays and she learned various roles off by heart and she, she had an ambition to be an actress. And um, she persuaded her mother that uh, she could do this. Now in those days, uh, there are a lot of misconceptions both then and now 
about the role of the actress in the 19th century. Um, in those days, people think it was a, a, an unrespectable profession. Um, and there was a close proximity between the theater and uh, the prostitution of women. But most theaters were very strict and stern about actresses having sort of gentleman followers, if you like. Most theaters worked very hard to keep prostituted women away from um, their theater companies and their performances. Um, and so that connection between actresses being prostituted is one that theater managers and the acting profession itself worked very hard to separate out. Although as you can see, Harriet Taylor's view of women who live with men without the benefit of the church, as she said, you know, in her letter to John Stuart Mill back in the 1830s, she doesn't see the moral kind of ignominy on women who enter into relationships with men without marriage. So, um, you know, I think that there's, there's, a, there's a, a kind of much more um, uh, accepting sort of viewpoint in this family. Um, but what Janet Smith and Claire Stern argue is that Hel Helen Taylor's life as an actress really gave her an insight into the lives of working people who have to scratch about for their next job. And that this was a really useful experience then for her later activism. Um, so I'm just, I, I've just sort of um, extracted uh, a series of descriptions of Helen Taylor's life as an actress from Janet Smith and Claire Stern's article. And they are using Helen Taylor's almost daily letters back to her mother, part of the um, agreement of her going away. And she went north first to Newcastle and Sunderland, then to Doncaster, then to Aberdeen and got jobs with uh, the local theatres in their companies then. And this is the time when each big town has its local uh, theatre royal with a permanent company and you sought um, a place in that company and then you acted the roles that the theatre manager gave you. Um, so here she's at the theatre royal in Newcastle, there's no work for her there so she goes to Sunderland and um, she's offered a variety of roles, none of which she's really interested in. Um, I've given you here an example of a playbill. I couldn't find any that featured Miss Trevor, which is the, the, um, the stage name she worked under. But you get a sense of the variety of shows that a theatre on any night would run. It's a bit like television. You sort of turn on the television at half past seven and you watch three programmes. You go to the theatre at seven o'clock at night and you come and go and you watch various plays. Um, now, the practice for most actresses and actors or actors coming into the theatre in the 19th century was that they were born into theatrical families. It was very much a family profession. And in my, my work as an academic, um, my principal work has been tracking particularly playwrights, but also female directors and producers. And often they are the wives or daughters or sisters of theatre managers. And they kind of get lost a little bit in that. They become a bit invisible. So Helen Taylor breaking into the profession without this sort of familial background had to kind of keep on fronting up to managers and saying give me a job and of course she just wanted to play Lady Macbeth she didn't want to play bit parts in a melodrama um, but finally she does um, get some roles and um, she does some small parts she develops her speaking voice they're in large theatres of um, five six hundred seats with no obviously no electric amplification. So the actor's voice and training the actor's voice to carry to the back of the theater, to be robust enough to do that, three or four nights, maybe up to six performances in a row. Um, and she learns how to do that. And she finally does get some roles. She improves, but in 1858, 
her um, career is cut short by her mother's illness. And she regrets to the end of her life that she was not able to go straight to Avignon where her mother died. Um, but Janet Smith writes, her acting apprenticeship had not been in vain. The voice that had struggled to carry a playwright's words to the back of the audience would throughout the 1880s and early 1890s fill packed halls as she championed women's and workers' rights. Miss, Taylor, Miss Trevor had become Miss Helen Taylor, social and political campaigner and tireless worker on behalf of the poor and oppressed. So, I thought that was really interesting to just give you a taste of the way that um, the, the kind of high, high culture of the intellectual philosophical world in which Helen Taylor was raised by her mother, Harriet, um, you know, from the Unitarian, um, radical Unitarian circles into her stepfather's circles of uh, radical philosophy. Um, and obviously sort of daily discussions of matters around law and the rights of women, um, how her work in this whole other area that is not seen to be connected um, actually comes together in uh, what I want to talk about next, which is Helen Taylor's activism. And I want to start first with the Contagious Diseases Act. And this is one of the first um, kind of activist campaigns that she works with with her stepfather. And this is an uh, extract from um, manuscript notes on the Contagious Diseases Act. Um, I could do a whole other talk about, well, there are other people who are better fitted to talk about the Contagious Diseases Acts, but it's this horrifying series of legislation in the mid 19th century in a bid to curb the um, spread of sexually transmitted diseases, syphilis and so on, um, in the port, in, in the sort of garrison towns, sorry, in port towns of Britain, because it was laying low <laughs> the standing armed forces of Britain. But instead of dealing with the men and their behavior, guess what? They try and control women's behavior. Um, and these are some manuscript notes um, which were not published, but as you can see my notes here, reproduced in Anne and John Robson's Sexual Equality and Mill Taylor Reader, a wonderful mirroring of Harriet Taylor and John Stuart Mill's um, collaboration within a marriage. Here's another collaboration of scholarship. Um, and you can see straight away, as no woman can have an opportunity to willfully spread a terrible disease, but by the voluntary consent of the man to whom she gives it, the real question is whether the law ought or ought not to interfere with the right of unchastity, because what the Contagious Diseases Act sought to do was to pull women off the street. Any woman that a, uh, a policeman or authority, uh, given authority by the magistrates or a um, sort of the equivalent of the military police, any woman that they saw on the street that they suspected of being a prostituted woman, they could pull her off the street. They could take her to what were called lock hospitals, that is secure hospitals, where she could be um, forcibly gynecologically examined. And I was going to put a picture on here of some of the um, gynecological uh, medical tools that were used to examine women, but they're too awful to look at on a Sunday morning. For me, not for, you know, for... Um, and um, uh, Coral Lansbury, late lamented Coral Lansbury, wrote a whole book about this. And she argued that the, um, uh, this forcible examination of women was akin to legal rape. Um, and what uh, Josephine Butler and other, you can see here, I've got a poster here of Josephine Butler, uh, what she and other very brave women publicly campaigned against was the ways in which it positioned all women as potentially prostituted women. Um, and it meant that a woman working to and from work on her own to a factory shift could be um, uh, forcibly detained and forcibly intimately examined. Um, so um, the one thing that Mill and Taylor, and in this case, it's Helen Taylor rather than Harriet Taylor, 
do say in their, do sort of imply in their notes is that respectable women here, innocent wives and children can never be injured by prostitutes, right? Um, they see a very deep distinction between respectable innocent women and prostituted women. Um, but I think that um, the final paragraph here in the final notes and I've sort of the their notes on um, parts of the bill so it's it's never it was never made into a published article but this final note at the bottom of my screen it is the inequality of the governmental pro uh, measures proposed which gives them their familiar color of supplying a class of women for men's wants as public houses and public carriages are supplied and makes it so mischief mischievous in its influence upon the moral ideas of men and boys so again although they do make this distinction between innocent women and prostituted women their final comment is on the fact that prostituted women are you know, produced by government measures, they produce a class of women to serve men's wants. Um, and I think we're very, we're still very familiar with that um, way, that, that governmental way of looking at women's bodies. Um, and I think that the equivalent, you know, the, 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 the debates today about prostituted women and so-called sex work and the debates about surrogacy and the um, availment of women's bodies to do men's wants, to produce men's wants, is still a very live issue. Um, so uh, you see here that um, Taylor and Mill are really still giving us the sort of fire for many of the issues that are still with us. Um, and John Stuart Mill um, was very supportive of people like Josephine Butler, although there is some debate about whether that the problem for that was that someone like Josephine Butler um, was seen as um, unqualifying herself for other kinds of public work because um, she uh, was able to talk, you know, she talked publicly about this very um, unpleasant subject. You know, it's talking about sex and sexuality um, publicly. So the final um, uh, section I want to look at is Helen Taylor's activism and her talk to the Kensington Society in 1865 um, on parliamentary suffrage for women. And again, what we see, and this is before the subjection of women was published, so we can see again the ideas that obviously she and her stepfather are discussing and the ideas that come through from um, a life lived as her mother's companion as well, Harriet Taylor's um, life. Um, uh, the reasons which make it desirable that women should have a share in making the laws by which they are to be governed are the same as those which are urged in favor of self-government and representative institutions in general. And this, you know, that it's sort of, it's almost like there's not much more you can say. The logic here is if we are having democracy, representative institutions, then the logic is that women as half the population need to be part of that. You know, it's, it's kind of, we look at it now and we go, yes, what else is there to say? Um, and she goes on to say, and again, this issue of sexual difference um, keeps coming up. And I think that, that um, it's something that both Helen and Harriet Taylor wrestle with together with John Stuart Mill. And I think, you know, it's, it's still a, a topic that we wrestle with, the nature nurture question. Um, none of these reasons uh, as usually presented have any reference to peculiarities of sex. And unless it be held that women are below or above the level or at any rate outside the pale of humanity, so as not to be judged by rules applicable to human nature in general, no rational reason can be given for depriving them of whatever advantage they may derive from the acceptance by their countrymen of those political axioms which have almost become truisms amongst us. Um, so, you know, if women are fully human, what's your problem? <laughs> Is really what she's saying to them. Um, and 
I'm, I'm flipping through that there, there is more um, and and hopefully if you're interested you email me for the the slides or go back to the YouTube video but I just I want to finish here um, this is uh, the positive end of Helen Taylor's activism she was elected to the London School Board and this is from her speech of that and it's about the education of women um, and again, I think it's really about the way that the importance of accepting women into the structures of civil society. And we haven't talked much about education, but it's something that Helen Taylor um, uh, is, is really, uh, you know, it can be seen by her, her public activism. Um, and her political work. If you wish to oppose the, me the education of girls as a means of keeping them, I will not say in their proper but in their improper place, you are taking the best means. So she's saying, you know, if you want to keep women down, don't educate them. That's the best way to do it. But remember the injustice to the intellectual program progress of women will react upon yourselves. If you retard the education of the girls, you will not attain liberty in the next generation for the mass of the population of the country. And this is just after 1870 is when the um, uh, first of the Education Acts is passed, which gives free education, I think, for all children up to the age of 11 or 12. So the issue of education as a public civic good for the progression of the country is a very live issue at this point. And Helen Taylor's argument here, again, it's this sort of absolutely, if you do this, then you have that. So I will finish there. Um, this is a list of my references of, that I found useful for the talk. Uh, but I think I'm bang on this. I think there's about three minutes until 11. So um, I might stop sharing my screen and see, hand, uh, pass over to Joe or Sheila to see if there are any burning questions that that um, have, have come up um, in, thank you for listening for this full hour. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Now I'm going to um, uh, see if I can, I don't, think I, I don't think I can get my video on, um, ask the start video, but thank you so much. And I, I've got a question and it might be that um, Sheila has a question as well, but my question is, in what way was um, Harriet Taylor and were Helen Taylor uh, revolutionary or, or the first to say these things? Did did they repeat a lot of what Wollstonecroft said and Olympe de Gouges and uh, how many feminists were there before them who'd written this stuff or was it completely new? Right. I'm, I'm As an historian, I'm not a great believer in the first because I think that's it's a kind of very... Oh, I think it's a very masculine way to look at it. Sorry, that's no, not, no, no um, shade on, on your question. But I think you're absolutely right to mention people like Wollstonecraft and Olympe de Gouges um, in that these are ideas that are in the air. I think what's distinctive about what the Taylors and Mill do is that they put them in a very pragmatic British way of thinking about the law, about the structures of civic society, and they give us a program for reform. Um, and they they give a very um, a very characteristic uh, utilitarian logic to the whole thing. And I think it comes out of the the very you know uh, Alum, uh, uh, the work of Alain de Gouges and other feminists. Um, out coming out of the French Revolution is extraordinary. And I think Mary Wollstonecraft reflects that. And it's much more about feeling. I think what we get from ta the tailors is this logic and this sort of, you know, kind of, and, and they really push it back to people. If this is what you think you want, you know, so I think that's where they're distinctive. I'm not sure about original or the first. I'm very, I'm always very kind of nervous of, of claiming firsts for anything. Um, but I think that what they do is, is they state these things in very direct, straightforward ways. Um, quite difficult as, you know, I've just had a quick glance at the chat. It is quite difficult material that they deal with at times. 
Um, and they do it in a very British way. You know, it's very pragmatic. It's very logical. It's very utilitarian. And I think that's kind of, you know, that's, 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 that's the, 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 the society they're speaking to. Oh, I, I can't hear you, Joe, for some reason. There we are. Thank you very much. Sorry, I muted myself. Yeah. Okay. Um, anyway, thank you very much. I've got loads more questions, but we're at 11 o'clock, 11.01 now. So thank you everybody for coming. Um, next week, we're going to listen to Susan Hawthorne and Caroline Norma talking about Vortex, the crisis of, I think, patriarchy. Uh, um, uh, so we've got another, let me just get the, the name of next week's talk. Um, so, and then we're going to have three weeks off. Yeah, so it's the vortex, the crisis of patriarchy next week. But thank you so much, Kate, for this week and um, see you all next week, probably. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening, Thanks. everyone. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye.